David's voice. We're going to be talking about the sound of silence. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now, and I just ask that as we open this teaching today, that you would open our ears and our eyes. We want to see Jesus in his name. Amen. I was nearly 17 years old when I remember hearing it the first time. It was a warm Illinois summer afternoon. I was hoeing potatoes in the vacant lot where my dad had planted his garden next door to our suburban Chicago home. At first, I wasn't sure what it was. I thought I was imagining things. It wasn't audible. In fact, if someone had been standing right next to me, they wouldn't have heard it. But I did. It was clear and it was distinct. It was as if, as if someone were speaking directly to me. Initially, I shrugged it off. No, no, it can't be, I reasoned. There's no way this could possibly... No way. I continued hoeing, but I continued hearing. It wasn't long. It wasn't loud. It was just there. Five words. And despite my efforts to ignore it, it persisted. I paused at the end of the row, clutching the handle of my hoe as beads of sweat poured down my furrowed brow. What am I going to do, I wondered. I shook my head to, as if to clear it. Am I going crazy? I squinted my eyes while staring into the cloudless sky. Lord, what's going on? Is that... Is that you talking to me? There it was again. Just five words. Phil, go talk to Scooter. I'm not hearing things, Lord. You really are talking to me. Phil, go talk to Scooter. I stood there in a daze, thinking. Scooter was a, a fellow a couple of years older than, than me. I didn't know him. In fact, I had never met the guy before. The only thing we had in common was a mutual friend. Why would you, Lord, possibly want me to visit Scooter? Still leaning against my hoe, I dialogued with God. I, I mean, Lord, Scooter isn't even a cr Christian. Aha. So that's what you want me to do, Lord. You want me to tell Scooter about you. Still deep in thought, reluctantly, I leaned a hoe against the garage. What could I possibly say to Scooter about God? Besides, he'd probably just laugh me off. Phil, go, go talk to Scooter and tell him your story. <clears throat> Before I could change my mind, I was off in a dash. I grabbed my duffel bag, a football, a baseball, and a couple of mitts. I got on my bike, and I went to see Scooter. God did an amazing thing that day. Yeah, he used me to tell Scooter about him, and I had never experienced that before. I was only 17. I'd like to believe my visit made an impact on Scooter's life. 
Yet the most incredible thing to me about the whole event was that God spoke to me that day. And I heard him. And that had never happened before. That event took place 40 years ago. And while I've heard that voice many times since then, the truth is, I've heard the sound of silence as much, if not more, than I've heard the voice of God. Why? Perhaps you have too. She sat there in front of me. Tears were streaming down her face. My wife and I had watched her grow up as a young girl. Her father and mother had been longtime family friends. In fact, they had been members of a church that I had pastored some time before. She had been active in her church, but not anymore. God seems so distant from me, Pastor Phil. And when I pray, all I hear is the sound of silence. I need God to be more tangible to me. If only I could hear his voice. If only I could sense his presence. The burden of this young lady is the heart cry of the human race. Even those from the pages of scripture who appear to have had close, intimate encounters with God had their times of despair and distance. Why does God choose to speak to mankind sometimes, while at other times he remains strangely silent? Why did he speak to Enoch, Noah, Moses, the prophets, the apostles, and yet I don't often hear his voice? I can handle the times when God speaks to me, when I sense his presence, but how do I cope? with the sound of silence. I'd like to share today with you five concepts that I've discovered as I've wrestled with the sound of silence. There's something interesting that I'd like you to notice in Scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. It's the story of Samuel. You recall how Samuel's mother, Hannah, had prayed for a child. A little over a year ago, I stood in the ruins of that temple. I was deeply moved to, to realize that it was on that site where, where Hannah had cried out to God in prayer. She had been barren, childless for years. And in that moment, in that place, God heard her prayer. I felt like I was on holy ground. When God answered her prayer, she took Samuel to the temple, to Eli, the high priest. She dedicated him to the Lord. He was about six or seven, and she left him there for lifelong service to God. Let's notice what the scripture says. 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli in those days. And, and notice it says, in those days the word of the Lord was what? Rare. The word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Israel during that period of time experienced the sound of silence from heaven. Of course, most of us know how the story progresses. It was during that very experience that verse 1 sets the stage for what happened next. It was in the middle of the night that God actually audibly spoke to Samuel as a boy, as, as just as a child. You remember how repeatedly Samuel, not accustomed to hearing the voice of God, assumed that it was Eli calling. He went to Eli's bedside three different times. Finally, Eli says, listen, go back. Go back. It's the voice of God who is calling. He instructed Samuel to say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. The Lord spoke to Samuel that night, and he gave him a word. It was obvious from that time forward that God directly communicated with Samuel. That God used Samuel. 
Samuel continued to grow spiritually and eventually became the high priest and the leader of all Israel. So why does God choose to speak to mankind sometimes, while at other times he remains strangely silent? Point number one, God reveals himself to help set one's life course. At times he reveals himself in rather dramatic ways. God spoke to me in the potato patch and that helped set the course of my life. It was a pivotal experience for me. I needed it then, that one incident, more than any other time in my life because it validated my calling to ministry. Samuel needed something dramatic to happen in his life, which set the, the course for his entire life journey. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Because you've had, you've had times when God has revealed himself to you in dramatic ways. But how do we deal with the here and now? How do we deal with the times of silence from heaven? Let's notice the the second book of Samuel, chapter 12. Israel has begun to prosper as a kingdom. David is the king on the throne. God had obviously led David in a very dramatic way. There were times when God had communicated himself directly to David as well. There were times when God gave David psalms to sing. There were times that God spoke to David, such as when he was facing the giant Goliath. We could cite numerous encounters that David had with the Almighty. But then we come to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Maybe David had come to the point where he was feeling a bit too smug in his life. Maybe his crown was fitting just a little too tight on his head. He was thinking about his accomplishments and all that he had done. Sadly, he had taken another man's wife and he had killed her husband when he discovered that she was carrying his child. It was then that the word of the Lord came to David through the prophet Nathan. When Nathan finished his message to David, notice what happened, beginning in verse 13. 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house, and, and, and he spent uh, the nights lying on the ground, the elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused. And he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves. And he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house. And at his request, they served him food, and he ate. David had heard the voice of God before. David had communicated with God before. And now, when he lays on the ground, when he's fasting and praying, pleading for God to listen, all he hears is the strange sound of silence. In Psalm 51, we find recorded David's prayer as a result of this whole experience. While he sensed a distance that 
that, that, that existed between him and God, while there was deep hurt and pain and guilt, David sensed tremendous renewal. This was David's prayer of confession after the birth and the death of his son. Psalm 51, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What do we learn from David's experience? There are times when God dramatically speaks to us to set the course of our life. But what about later in life when we pray and, and, and all we hear is heaven's strange silence? As I read this story of David, I, I sensed that maybe in one respect, God is silent. But in another respect, God was indeed communicating to David which leads me to point number two. Could it be at, that at times when we sense the silence of God, that maybe through the silence, God is endeavoring to communicate to us something that we need to learn then and there? How do we listen to him? How do we cope with the sound of silence? Silence. Point number three, God doesn't always reveal himself verbally. He reveals himself through nature, and he reveals himself through his word. Sometimes, however, we, we get so hung up on wanting the tangible. We live in a society that demands things instantly in our presence. We live in a society that's comprised of high-speed internet, access to multi-page per minute document printing, and so on. We can't wait. We must see it to believe it. And yet I think it's important for us to recognize that God doesn't always reveal himself verbally. Psalm 119, 105 tells us this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He reveals himself through nature and through his word. Maybe the answer that God has for our prayer already exists, but we just haven't taken time to look for it. Point number four. God sometimes uses people and events to reveal himself to us. Sometimes we say, Lord, why are you silent? Why aren't you tangible to me? Why can't I see you here and now? I found myself saying that a number of times this week. I wanted God to give me a tangible answer as to whether I should accept the nomination as executive secretary of the Southern California Conference. It wasn't a position I was seeking. I don't believe I placed myself in any, in, in any position that would cause me to feel I was obviously looking for something like that, which I have not. It's not something that I lay awake dreaming at night about doing. I just want to be a foot soldier of, the, of, of God in the trenches of ministry. That's all I want to do. And yet Wednesday night when Elder Ricardo Graham, president of the Pacific Union, called to inform me of the nomination and asked me for my response by 11 o'clock Thursday morning, this is what I told him. I said, Elder, if you want me to say yes to this call, then you better pray that an angel of the Lord appears to me in a vision of the night. I was planning to tell him no. But you know what, folks? That didn't happen. There was no angel in the night. In spite of the fact that I wrestled with God most of the night, there wasn't any bright light at the foot of my bed. Thursday morning when I got out of bed very early, I dropped to my knees and I began to pray and wrestle with God more. And like I say, I was doing it all alone. 
I didn't have my soulmate by my side. Maybe that was a good thing. Maybe it was a journey I needed to take on my own. I consulted her. I listened to her wisdom. But I was also listening for something else. I was listening for the crash of thunder and the voice of God, but all I heard was silence. I decided to call my daughter Elizabeth early Thursday morning. I knew that she was on her way to work two hours ahead of our time. And I had one of the most profound conversations that I have ever had with my daughter. Papa, why are you hesitant to accept this call? Are you scared? She was as frank with her papa as she has ever been in her life. Are you scared, papa? I said, yes, honey, I am really scared. Why are you scared, she asked. Is it because you don't think that you have the tools in your toolbox to do the job? I said, I guess that's a pretty good way to put it, honey. To which she said, Papa, I want to tell you something and never forget it. It is not about the tools in your toolbox. It's about the tools in God's toolbox. And his toolbox is a whole lot bigger than yours. And then Elizabeth talked really straight to her papa. Papa, I know your personality. And I know that it prefers the known and familiar. But you can't be a control freak, papa. You need to recognize that God is in control and let him be. After my call with Elizabeth, the Lord led me to a couple of power stories powerful statements from the writings of Ellen White. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 100. When we take into our hands the management of things with which we have to do and depend upon our own wisdom for success, we are taking a burden which God has not given us and are trying to bear it without his aid. We are taking upon ourselves the responsibility that belongs to God and thus are really putting ourselves in his place. We may well have anxiety and anticipate danger and loss, for it is certain to befall us. But when we really believe that God loves us and means to do us good, we shall cease to worry about the future. We shall trust God as a child trusts a loving parent. Then our troubles and our torments will disappear, for our will is swallowed up in the will of God. And then this quotation I found from the book Desire of Ages. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Wow. Wow. I was blown away. And then my son Anthony talked to me, and he had a, a similar conversation as his sister. And then he said, Papa, it's time that you start practicing the advice that you're so ready to give everyone else. I got in my car Thursday morning, and I drove off to a pastor's meeting near Glendale, the Eagle Rock Church. And on the way, my son-in-law, Pastor Rob Carlson, called me and he said, Papa, I know you've got an important decision to make and you need to make it in just a few hours. So I want to pray with you right now. And then he prayed. Dear Lord, please be with Papa. May he follow your leading. And one more thing, Lord. I'm asking that between now and 11 o'clock, when he has to give his decision, that you do something dramatic that will seal his decision in his mind one way or another. In Jesus' name, amen. I pulled into the parking lot of the Eagle Rock Church where our pastor's meeting was to be held. 
I got out of my car and was preparing to walk into the church when a fellow pastor approached me. He said, I need to talk with you. He pulled me aside and he told me that he was a member of the Southern California Conference Constituency Session Nominating Committee. He said, I know that you know the decision the nominating committee made last night to ask you to be the nominee for executive secretary. I just want to talk to you about the process because I think you need to know. He then told me how the committee arrived at my name and why after a season of prayer they felt confident that I should be the nominee. He then prayed for me that I would hear God's voice. And in that moment, I did. <laughs> Two hours later, I called Elder Graham. I know the answer you're probably expecting to hear from me after our conversation last night, I told him. There was no bright light with an angel of the Lord in a vision of the night. I didn't hear the voice of the Lord in the wind. I didn't hear the voice of the Lord in the fire. I didn't hear the voice of the Lord in the earthquake. But I heard the voice of the Lord in the still small voice of my family and my colleagues. In spite of my sense of inadequacy, I am willing to be the conduit of the Lord and accept the nomination to be the executive secretary of the Southern California Conference and the position subject to my election on the 17th of May. Elder Graham was shocked. And he told me at that time that he and his wife Audrey had spent much of the night in prayer wrestling over this issue too. Psalm 32, 8. David said in his encounter with God, in confidence that God, God was speaking to him, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. David had that confidence in spite of the fact that sometimes he didn't hear the audible voice of God. God seldom instructs us audibly. But I heard the voice of God this week and was reminded once again that sometimes God uses people and events to reveal himself to us. Point number five, our last point. During times of silence, God wants us to recollect the times when he has made his presence known. Several years ago, I received a telephone call from a friend. I had borrowed some tools from this friend, and a friend needed the tools back. In fact, they told me that they needed the tools as soon as possible. Any chance you could get me the tools? They called me in the evening, need the tools by noon tomorrow. It was an extremely busy day for me. I had much on my schedule, but I knew I needed to get them the tools right away. I started searching. I searched, and I searched, and I searched some more. But the tools weren't anywhere to be found. I searched for an hour. I got down on my hands and knees. I was looking underneath the sofa. I looked underneath the bed. I, I, I looked in the closet. And while I was on my hands and knees, I pleaded with God, Lord, you know what's on my schedule today. You know my time constraints. Please help me. But all I heard was silence. I searched for another hour. I looked from one end of the house to the other. I searched every drawer, every closet, every place I could think of, the garage, everywhere. Now, friends, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I even looked in the refrigerator and the freezer. I found myself on my hands and knees again, crying out to God, Lord, help me. Where are you, God? How come you're not listening to me? And all I heard was silence. I searched for a third hour. 
still no tools. And after that, I made a decision. I said, God, I don't know why you're not, why you haven't chosen to answer my prayer when I needed it. I don't know why I haven't, uh, 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 why I haven't heard from you. I can't search anymore, Lord. I don't have any more time. I've got much on my schedule. I've got to get these, the tools to these people. I told the Lord that the only alternative I had was to go out and purchase some new tools and replace them for the, to the individual. And when I had resolved that in my mind and had come to a place of complete peace, I said, okay, God, maybe you're not going to answer me. Maybe all I'm going to hear today is the sound of silence. That's okay, God, because I know there have been many times in my life in the past that you have answered my prayers in dramatic ways. And just because you're not choosing to answer this one now, I know you are still on your throne. I know you're still in control. I know you still love me. I came to a place of complete peace in my life. And with that, I got up off my knees and was heading to the door to go purchase some new tools when, when I had a sudden impulse. It, it, it was almost as if an unseen hand were guiding me. I went back into the living room and I walked over into the corner of the living room to the magazine rack. It was full and overflowing with magazines. I leaned over and one by one pulled off the magazines. And you guessed it, there on the bottom of the pile were the tools. Every single one of them. I don't know how they got there, but they were there. And I've got to tell you that I got on my knees and I said, thank you, Jesus. As I look back on that incident, it's interesting to discover that I found the tools after I had come to the point of personal peace. Okay, God, if you're going to be silent, that's okay. Because there have been many other times that I have heard your voice. There have been other times that I've seen you. And I know, Lord, that even if I never find those tools, you still love me and care for me. I came to that conclusion because I remembered the times in my life when God had made his presence known. Some people rather enjoy silence. There are some people that have a rather acute sense of hearing. They are particularly sensitive to noise. In fact, any little sound or excessive noise irritates them. I know that because I'm married to one of those individuals. I've come to learn when Pastor Jan has had all she can take. And when I haven't, she reminds me. And I would suspect that if the truth were known, most of us enjoy times of silence, too. Several years ago, my cousin, who lives in the heart of Portland, Oregon, drove with his family to my brother-in-law's ranch in the state of North Dakota. When he got out of the car with his family, wife and his daughter, he paused for a moment and, and he turned to them and he says, listen, do you hear that? They looked at him strangely and they says, no, we don't hear a thing. And he said, exactly. Silence is a good thing at times. But how do I deal with the times when God seems so distant and silent to me? How do I handle life when I need a tangible God? How do I cope with the sound of silence from heaven? Let's review our five points. God reveals himself first 
to help set one's life course. Number two, God communicates through silence. I believe that at times that we sense the silence of God, maybe through the silence, God is endeavoring to communicate something to us that we need to learn then and there. Someone once said, he who does not understand God's silence will probably not understand God's words. And the psalmist came to understand that himself when he said, be still and know that I am God. And then point number three, God reveals himself through nature and through his word. God doesn't always reveal himself audibly. He reveals himself through nature and he reveals himself through his word. We don't always need the tangible. Maybe the answer is right under our nose. And point number four, God uses people and events to reveal himself to us. God wants us to remember the times when he has made himself known. From time to time in our lives, we experience the apparent sounds of silence from God. And while that seems frustrating to us, there is a time coming when I am truly looking forward to the sound of heaven's silence. Listen to Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Why was there silence in heaven for about half an hour? Recognizing the prophetic nature of the book of Revelation, we can aptly apply the day-year principle to this passage. Follow me carefully. If prophetic time, if in prophetic time one literal day equals one literal year, then 24 prophetic hours also equals one literal year. That being the case, one half prophetic hour equals approximately one literal week. So what's significant about that? Revelation chapter 8 reveals the opening of the last of the seven seals. The opening of this seal involves the second coming of Jesus. The context clearly reveals this fact. The sound of silence in heaven results because Jesus and all the heavenly beings have left heaven to redeem the saints on earth. And there is silence in heaven a period that will last approximately one literal week. I don't believe it's going to take a a week for Christ to descend from heaven to earth. But I believe that perhaps it will take a week for Jesus to get his saints from from earth to heaven. You see, during that time, I believe Jesus is going to do a little globetrotting through the universe. He's going to show off his trophies to the rest of the unfallen worlds. And kind of like an Olympian running a victory lap to show his gold medal. The sound of silence. We may not enjoy it when when it pertains to our apparent unanswered prayers. But there's a day coming when all the faithful will welcome heaven's sound of silence. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filling it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. With a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. At times, I have difficulty with heaven's sound of silence. You probably do too. But today I appeal to you to trust Jesus even through his silence. That's the lesson I learned this week. Listen. Do you hear that? No more silence. It's the sounds of his coming. I can hear the sounds of His coming everywhere In the headlines resounding by the score It may be another earthquake or just another war but to every child of God, it's something more. And when I hear the sound of marching, hear the sound of battle cry, then I know my Lord is coming. Even now it may be nigh, and I can hear the sounds of His coming everywhere. They're getting louder and louder each day. And they'll crescendo until that great and final sound when the trumpet shall call me away. I can hear the sound of fig leaves rustling in the summer breeze as the Lord prepares the new Jerusalem. I can hear a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind as God pours His Spirit out upon all men. And when I hear revival sounds, not just here, but everywhere, then I know it's almost over. I can feel it in the air. And I can hear sounds of His coming everywhere. They're getting louder and louder each day. And they'll crescendo until that great and final sound when the trumpet shall call me away and I can hear the sounds of His coming everywhere they're getting louder and louder each day and they'll crescendo 
Until that great and final sound When the trumpet shall call me away When the trumpet shall call me away Father God, there are some times that we're frustrated with the sound of silence. We call out to you and, and we wait and we wrestle and we don't hear you. But from this teaching today, may we remember that you are close. You are always there for you will never leave us nor forsake us. May we be attentive to your still small voice in whichever way you choose to use it on us. May we be ready to listen. May we be ready to follow. We ask and pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus, who one day soon will descend from glory and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, we will no more hear the sound of silence, but we will live the ceaseless ages of eternity with you. May that day be soon, we ask and pray in Jesus' name.